Hey there, coaches. I'm Rich Prado, owner of Play In School and host of Travel Ball Talk, where I talk to travel ball coaches from the best organizations about the current and future state of travel baseball. Today's guest is Joe Barth Jr., founder of Tri-State Arsenal. For the majority of our listening audience, Coach B needs no further introduction beyond the fact that he is the hit doctor. I hope you enjoy this episode of Travel Ball Talk. All right, here we are back on another episode of Travel Ball Talk. I'm super excited today to have Joe Barth Jr. on the call. Now, I believe his friends and his players call him Coach B. So I'm going to stick with Coach B if that's okay with you, Coach. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) Okay, Coach. For those of you listening who've been around the world of travel ball for a long time, you all know, or at least you've heard, probably much of Coach B's background. Um, but for the younger coaches, uh, or maybe the, the West Coast or the, or the guys from different parts of the country who maybe don't know Coach B as well, do you mind going through a little bit of your origin story? How did you get into baseball? And, um, and where did the coaching part of baseball start for you, Coach B? Well, I I grew up in a baseball family. My mother and father went to two games a day while he scouted, and on the weekend they'd go to four a day. And then the whole family would discuss how the games were coached over the dinner table. So it really, if it wasn't for my brother being the best coach in New Jersey, my mother probably could have been the second best. But uh, <laughs> the whole family knew, knew baseball, and so when I made a call and, and it didn't work out, I guess second guess from mom dad and everybody <laughs> so we we covered a lot of games uh talked about a lot of them and then i i played at Ryder college we were at the time i was there Ryder was a national power believe it or not um and uh my career ended short abruptly during v- vietnam i got drafted and I went but uh at some point in my college career i was asked to make a lot of changes and i went from being a real good hitter to not such a hot hitter. And um, I feel like it's what I didn't know that killed me. So then I went on this obsessed thing, trying to help my dad with Brooklyn Legion and Gloucester Cali. And I did all their hitting stuff. I, and then I realized we had to get better at pitching. So I did the same thing with pitching. But I wrote, one year I wrote 1,500 college coaches and every pro coach there was and ask them if I could work their camps or come with them at the spring training or, you know, be a, pick up the trash to try to learn from them. And practically everybody said yes. So I spent a couple of years learning, studying tape. Nobody really had the answers at that point. So what I've come to realize is all the changes I made were wrong and that I was better off when I first started. And my dad always said I peaked at 12, but <laughs> mechanically I probably did. But uh, anyway, what I learned over 67 years, I saw every great player is an original. And you can't coach him or take away his original. Or you're going to roam. And a, a player, by the time he's at high school age, he's doing things because his body told him to. So if you're going to make mass changes, you, you're probably going to disrupt his whole kine- kinetic chain. And that's what's going on today is people – Everybody has a to to do book or go online. This is what how you hit one way to hit, one way to pitch, and it's just wrong. So, um, I, I, we're talking about a little bit last year. Uh, what, I, I I started out 40 years ago teaching hitting. What I did is I studied the whole thing. I tried to find their commonalities, and that's all I taught. Right now, Major League Baseball is putting it out. The problem is there's a lot of great information available to the major leaguers, but it's not necessarily available to American kids. When a Dominican guy goes home from a long season in the big leagues, first thing he does is take mama out for dinner and the kids, but the next morning is down at these pro baseball um, fields that are supplied by American major league teams, and he's training the little kids and telling them, hey, if you want to go to America and be a multi-multi-millionaire like me, you got a long toss. You got to do this. You got to do that. And uh, when's the last time you've seen a superstar come come to your neighborhood and show the kids anything? Mm, interesting. And our, our little league, yeah, our youth league coaches are basically teaching baseball circa 1950. 
the exception, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna brag a little. The exception, in my opinion, I know one guy that comes home every year and works with the local kids, and that's Mike Trout. And he goes back back down to Florida to hit and get ready for the season and go fishing and this and that. But he goes back to Millville and works with all the kids in the off season and donates a lot to the little league. I mean, he didn't forget where he came from. And he also, uh, you know, he was taught and he was taught somewhat by us. I think his dad, his dad's one of the greatest coaches. His dad worked for me for a while, quite a few years, but he's one of the best hitting coaches I've ever seen. So, um, and they share their information, but what, what my new idea well, let's Start hang on before with, you go, before yeah, go you ahead. get too far into this, yeah. let's, let's pause there. Cause you, you mentioned a bunch of different things and I want to, I want to just pull yeah. a little more out of you there. First off you're, if, if memory serves me correctly, you're in the, um, the, the Philly area of New Jersey, correct? Yes, yes sir. Yes, Cher- sir. Cherry Hill sort of area. Yeah. Matt, yeah. Matt Lyle boy is right in there. Okay, cool. And when you were growing up, you were saying your your dad was scouting. Who was he scouting with? He scouted for the Phillies for quite a while. <laughs> That's awesome. And your yeah. and and your and your mother, she she was. Uh, she never missed a game. No kidding. She never missed a game. Uh, uh, they were going to games till they were ninety two and passed away uh, about a week apart. And uh, they were inseparable, and they they went to a gazillion games. Which my mom. Yeah, she never sold baseball games until she met my dad, but she, she never missed one after. And she she became a super fan. She was really something. But anyway, my dad was involved with the Legion team until he was 92. He started in 1951 and coached it up to like 2007 or 8. And uh, he got to the point where he was too sick to do it. But the yeah. book on Legion was like a family thing, you know. Right, right, right. And so between he and you, you guys have been connected to the Legion program up there for half a century? Yes. Half a century, maybe? Maybe longer? Years. Unbelievable. Yeah. Hey, yeah. do me do me Plus a favor. Make years. make sure or try to not muffle the uh the microphone on your phone so we can hear you nice and yeah, clear so we don't miss it. Yeah. So we so we don't miss any of the stories. Um so uh, the American Legion is where you really got your feet wet and and what years was that when you were starting coaching with your dad at the at the american legion uh i coached the local 13 to 15 year old team that fed him from 72 to 77 and then 78 i took over the legion program okay and 1979 i went to coach foster calvary okay that was always the legion teams one of the legion teams based schools but so that between me my dad and my brother that's going to be uh 70 years next year of legion baseball i so, thought it runs it now so. so so down down here where i live in richmond the first time i can remember any sort of um, baseball facility or any sort of uh, opportunities for private instruction I'm, i mean beyond you know just getting with a guy in the backyard that's always been a thing or out at out at the ballpark right. but the first time i can remember the more official kind of, you know, like a business, like a facility where you're going, yep. you're giving the guy some money, he's giving you a lesson, that type of thing. The first time I remember it was in about 1996 here in Richmond. You started something yeah, well, called, you started the facility and you, you're known as the hit doctor. What years, right. what year did that start up in, up in New Jersey? Uh, mid mid eighties. Uh, I, I I forget who it was. It was back around the Bobby Higginson and Jesse Levis. I had a bunch of guys that, that, that ended up making the big leagues, but a few of them would come to my backyard to hit, and I'd write up what they had to do till the next time they came. And they, and they said, oh, it's like going to the doctors. Every time we come here, we, <laughs> we get we're written our prescription. We come back, and then one day one of them came with this big sign said the hit doctor and it looked good my my wife liked it but i basically built my um i built i was a cpa at, when i went full-time into this and i built the baseball business to to mirror uh, a doctor's office so what we did for each player was we videotaped them then we would diagnose what was wrong with them then we 
build a drill plan around him specifically because no hitters alike. Sure. Um, if, if he was an uppercut and there are 17 causes for uppercutting, he, he did this, this, and this that caused his uppercut. So he had different drills than somebody else who uppercut other ways or for other yeah. things. So that's basically what it is. We, and everywhere I went, I spoke all over the country. I said, hey, doctor, I've got a drill you've never seen before. And uh, that's where I got most of them. I stole it from the best, from the best hitting coaches all over the country. I, I stole their best drills and applied it to the kids because if it could help one of my kids, I'm using it. I lo- and so that's what we did. I love that. They would come in, you would diagnose their their problem, and then you would write right. a prescription for them, and that's their drill set, and that's how you became known as the hit doctor. Yep. That's yeah, an, probably, that's an I, awesome story. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, so, and it, and it, spread, it spread because it was something different, you know? Well, that's just so. it. It was different. And, again, you beat – you beat the coaches, at least to my recollection, in this area. There was nothing like that until the until the late nineties. Well, so you beat. We, we were, yeah, we you, were, we were, uh, yeah, we were the only show in town for quite a while. And I started the showcase business at that time. And uh, you know how, how, how everything changed. And then there came a time when I was starting to move all my customers to uh, travel teams, and dads would take over a team. And and uh, grab a couple kids from the little league, and then get a bunch more, and tell them, "Look, you don't have to pay me anything. I'll train you in my garage." And it's like, what is this travel ball? And finally, you know, I, I would have had to close my business, so I, I you know, can't beat them, join them. I got into the travel ball and now. Of course, that's tremendous. Uh, so, it's gotten well. Let's better let, and better. Let's identify exactly the travel ball team. That's Tri-State Arsenal. What in what year? Uh, was your your first set of teams? Do you remember? Well, uh, my son and one of my assistants started uh, at one team back in the late nineties, beginning nineties, and then uh, I retired in two thousand one from the, um, the Legion team because I, I, I don't know. I, I just. Uh, was burn out maybe I don't know. Uh, I went out 365 days a year. So then my daughter got married in 2001, and I, I felt like man, I, I just gave her away. I haven't even been with her that much. So I, I, I vowed not to have it again with my other kids, my other daughter. But anyway, I, I, I rested for a year, and my wife, she was, I was driving her crazy. She would, she would, she would pay me to go back to coach, and, and then finally. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I was still doing the academy, and somebody called my son who was uh, running it in my absence, running some of the stuff in my absence, and they said, would the hit doctor be interested in running a 15-year-old travel team? And he said, yeah, of course. He meant the company, and this guy meant me. Well, the next morning, it was in all the papers, you know, the hit doctor coming out of retirement to coach this travel team. So <sighs> I, I took a 15-year-old team. They had never won anything. Never got out of the first pool of anything, and we took them over, and we ended up in the World Series. And uh, East Cobb had won 15 years in a row at 15, 16, and 17. And we beat them, and it, it, I mean, it, we got headlines in the, all the Atlanta papers. Uh, it said East Cobb <laughs> beaten by upstart or whatever, but it was amazing. I didn't know what the hell it was. And they had a lineup like you couldn't believe. It's all pro guys, all all future major leaguers. We beat them, I think it was five to four, and that was it. From there, it, it sort of exploded. Now it's way beyond that. Every every kid's on a travel team. I don't necessarily like the way it's going, but um, you, you have to do it because uh, all the scouting's based on tra- travel ball. So. Sure, sure. Now I don't want to. I don't want to get too far out of the 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 background of hit doctor and tri-state um you were ahead of your time it was like you were you know seeing around the corner and i mean did did people think you were crazy to go into baseball instruction you're leaving a a job a nice cushy job as a cpa did did people did people wondering what the heck you were doing in the you know in the mid mid to late 80s Yeah, everybody thought I was going to see now. I was not the only person that 
knew I was doing the right thing besides me was, was my wife. She, she asked me what took so long. I, uh, I was getting to the point where I was doing one camp a year to feed, feed the high school and the Legion team. And, and I was drawing kids from all over that wanted to do that, wanted more when I opened it up, you know, and it's like, for years, I did 40, 50 hours in the accounting office and then went out late and did Gloucester Catholic in Brooklyn. Uh, and that was every day, all year long. And uh, when, when uh, the opportunity came to open a business, I, I sort of jumped at it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I really was, I was good at income taxes. That's about it. I couldn't sit still and do accounting. We found out years later that I had ADD. Uh, that, that would explain that. Couldn't couldn't get a worse job for um, someone with ADD than a, 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 an accountant that maybe air traffic controller. I could have wiped out the whole country in one day. But <laughs> when, you know, when we when we baseball. spoke um, when we spoke two days ago, you you mentioned a book that I think that that I think sums up the way that you were able to see around the corner back in the eighties or see the future. I think it's called uh, the Blue Ocean Blue Ocean Strategy, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, that was a best song in, in New York. And basically, you say that anybody that got rich jumped in a, a, a sky blue ocean with, with no, nothing in it. Now, hey, try try not to time, so. try not to cover up that that microphone. I'm losing you a little bit. Okay, that's better. Oh, sorry about that. Is that better? A little bit. Yeah, uh, blue blue ocean strategy says hey. Don't jump in the waters with eight million sharks in the bloody waters of, uh, of a, the hot business, which is what everybody does. This guy's a little successful. I'm going to try it. You know, the TVs do the same, same kind of things. You know, but um, when I was in it, I was the only show in town. Now, there's 600 travel organizations in New Jersey alone, and there's academies everywhere. Yeah, because people jumped in it. They saw that I was doing good. Other people jumped in it, and now everybody has a academy a, a team or whatever i think you're going to see a huge change in the next couple of three years uh right now the parents are confused they don't know what to go where to go where they're getting their information well they're getting their information from guys that maybe couldn't play and you know they got released by the mets because they they were too wild or they hurt their arm real bad because their mechanics were bad or they couldn't hit a fastball or they couldn't hit a curve now they open up a Academy say former Mets Louis Tatuli, I'll teach all your kids. I'm a former Met. Well, he's no more a former Met than the man in the moon. And <laughs> the people are flocking to all these kids, and there's so much misinformation on the internet and from all these coaches who are basically teaching what they did that the kids aren't getting the proper information. Meanwhile, the Dominican and Latin players they're killing us at our own sport by teaching the little kids the major league way. So. Yeah, I'm I'm old. I can close in a minute. So my my thought process now is, I've been teaching launch angle, although I never say it. Uh, I've been teaching that for forty years. But the the point is, they people need major leaders to tell them, and so that's what my do venture is. I got all major league guys. Maybe they'll have more credibility than me teaching the kids the current major league things. And we're so plugged in with MLB that we're eliminating the middleman. This is what's being taught in the major leagues by the Houston Astros. They're probably the most forward organization in baseball. Hitting-wise, them them and uh, the Red Sox. Okay, this is what they're being taught. It's it's not, you know, swing level, get your elbow up, squeeze the bat, do this. No. We watch them. We film them. We show them what major leaders do next to them. And then we compare the two. If there's no differences, we try to get them a contract with the Phillies because I'm a Phillies fan. But in nine to- 99 cases out of 100, we have to tell them what they have to do to fix it. And it's a long-term process in baseball. You, you, you don't just learn how to hit overnight. It takes a lot of reps. That's why everybody's running this soccer and lacrosse. Because, mm. you know, you can take some, some guy and just – stick him in the middle of the field. Nobody will ever know he's terrible at soccer or lacrosse. So he'll play seven or eight years before he finds out how bad he is. Mm-hmm. Little League, they, they have a way of, this, of uh, exposing a, a kid 
yeah, it's and called, running them out of the game, you put called, them in right field and strike them out three times. Well, it's it's called the curveball. When you find out you can't yeah, play. Yeah, well, that too. When you can't that's hit the curveball, you become a people. soccer player. Yep, yep. And, I mean, it's just so much mi- misinformation going out. you got little kids throwing shot puts. Uh, kids are, haven't even reached puberty yet doing these universal lifts, you know, weighted balls, boom, boom, boom. It's crazy. I got all these guys in the high 90s, to, and, and they, that, they don't have to do none of that stuff. But the, I, I, I think it's good if, if you have the money to have a personal trainer checking you out all the time and monitoring everything that you do. But most people don't do that. So these sophisticated patch, pack, packages that they pay $500 for ends up causing them to get Tommy John. And, mm-hmm. I mean, it's happening at record numbers now, kids getting hurt. Yeah, they throw a little harder. They can't pitch. But uh, – they sure throw hard enough to blow their arm out. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, I got quite a few major league guys, former major league players that, that get it, that understand that we're going to try to take our stuff, you know, across the country. And, uh, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing now. You know, so we'll see. So see how it works. Let's take a short break from this call to talk about my day job video in 2019. If you aren't leveraging film, to market your guys, you are doing them a disservice. So where do I come in? Well, filming one guy on your iPhone and texting it to coaches or posting it to Twitter is easy. But filming 25, 50, 100, or 200 is really hard. And that's why you haven't done it already. That's why smart coaches partner with Play In School. We do all the work. We come to you. We can film 100 guys in the time it would take you to film just four or five. If you'd like to see every team we partner with, visit playinschool.com slash teams. Contact me today to discuss the details. Now, back to the call. In the in the news we read that um the tri state arsenal exchanged hands, what was it, two two years ago at this point? Yeah, I saw the New Jersey uh academy uh and that, that the, the people that bought it for me i gave them the whole mid-atlantic region uh, the, i still i still own the rest of the country and in canada and this year we're expanding okay so you're you're you states. technically are still in the showcase um travel ball world you know so yeah. so so if you wanted to start up a, a new tri-state arsenal branded team out of you know, pick a pick a state out of Florida or out of Michigan or out of California, that would still be you. But but you also have another venture that you're that you're really putting a lot of focus in with the camp business, and that's yeah. I think is that what you're talking about when you're talking about your major leaguers in the major. Yeah, we're trying to take. Talk, we're trying to. What's take the name of that? What's the name of that camp? Um, camp company. Well, it's, it's, the company's all American, but uh, we have the college coach camps that are staffed by all college coaches, some of the top guys in the country. We have hit doctor camps, which I train former major league guys. And, I mean, it's been a give and take thing. Uh, here's how you teach the launch angle. Here's how you measure them. We measure the kids in 21 to 27 physicalities and baseball things so that they can track that and know I've gotten way better in, 20, in all 27 things I have to do to be a shortstop because they're just not doing that. And so I, I have all American college coach camps, pick doctor hitting camps. And then we started flamethrowers because I got a zillion major league pitchers here. that don't agree with a lot of the stuff that's going on and um, putting players at risk to throw one mile an hour harder when you have to do 13 things to be a dominant major league pitcher. And only one of them is to throw hard. You know what I mean? And nobody's touching on the other 12 things. It's it's terrible. So, like, I see guys at both the game that throw 90 every day, every game. But when you ask me how many of them can really pitch, three pitch guys that can locate, got a good curve or change up, hold runners on it, you're down to a handful or less. And so they're not – people aren't teaching – the game there's just, and there's too much emphasis on velocity but it, if Joe Barr says it 
you know, they don't necessarily listen. If a major league guy that they recognize says it, then it's a little different. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hire former major league guys who maybe didn't make the millions of dollars they make nowadays, but maybe retired a little bit before that. And you don't have to go very far back where they weren't making that kind of sure, money. Sure. And they want to keep their foot in the door, keep their hand in it. They they go back all the time to their organization and they see all the changes and say, wow, I wish I had known that. So that, it was very easy once I started showing them what we were doing because it jived with a lot of these teams. But um, it, it's pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't want to talk talk launch angle but that they have to because that it they're right and what we were taught as kids is wrong and so uh there's no one set of launch angles for any kid that's determined by the kid's strength level bat speed and all kind of other things okay but you you have to know if he's hitting too many grounders or too many fly balls you got to know why mm-hmm. and it's, it starts with knowing what range he's successful at because every five miles an hour that the pitchers go up, their launch angle sometimes has to change. Yeah. And without testing it all the time, I don't know how you can, can possibly do that. You know what I mean? So I, you know, I'd like, I'd like to say, well, do it the way I did it in a little way, but, but, but that's not necessarily right anymore. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but the Houston Astros just fire a lot of their hitting coaches through the minors and majors and everything, because they feel like, they're so bogged down in traditional teachings, they cannot absorb the information that they've been trying to get to them, and that the players are better off just just going with uh, the readings on their bat speed and bat angles and contact areas, and they have all the information they need to be successful. Uh, I don't know if they're right, but uh, I it goes to show you they feel like there's definitely numbers that can dictate how a guy should swing. Uh, I still think you need a guy on the bench that knows what to look for in s- situations or how this guy's going to pitch him. Somebody has to help him, but you know what I mean? It, mm-hmm. it, it's changed. American players are at a severe disadvantage because our major leaguers are not coming home and showing the kids. I mean, Mike's the first guy that I, I, I've ever had or known of that came back and taught all the kids in town. You know what I mean? Cool. And, and is willing to help other people. They, they had a boy drafted two years ago, a real good player named Buddy Kennedy. Michael took him under his wing like it was his own brother. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like he, he, he works with him all the time. And that happens in the Dominican. It happens in Cuba, Puerto Rico. But it's not happening, it's not happening here. And uh, there's a couple uh, – you probably know this, Rich. There's a couple pitching gurus, driveline and – Oregon and uh, mm-hmm. Welford in Texas. Yeah. Them guys are really good. They got really sophisticated equipment, and yeah. they got a lot of pro guys that stop in there. But for one of my kids to go there, it costs seventeen ninety five for the week. By the time they get the plane fare and this and that, you're talking three thousand for a week. My yeah. pitchers, just like the Houston Astros pitchers, have to work at their body or pitching three hundred sixty five days a year. They can't afford seventeen hundred a week. Yeah, for sure. 52 weeks. So what I'm going to try to do is take the professional pitchers to their home area and make it available, at least in this state and that state and so forth. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's got to come through these major league guys uh, to keep the latest uh, the latest information. The major league spend millions of dollars finding out what they know. You can't poo-poo and say they don't know what they're talking about. Sure. They do. And... Uh, that's it, you know, but we can look at a video now and, and really help a kid if he wants to do it, but he still has to put in the reps to master whatever the techniques are, you know? Well, listen, I want to do a little bit of a, a little bit of a zig or zag here um, and talk about travel baseball, the world of travel baseball. It's obviously changed since you first found it. Um, tri-state arsenal so you you've you've seen some things come and go let's talk about today the the current 2019 model of of travel baseball what what is what are a couple things you you like let's be positive to start with what are a couple of things you like about the current state of travel baseball well uh some of the the major tournament companies like perfect game um we love perfect game 
Mike Trout's dad, I won't say was, he was as good as Mike, but I had a lot of guys I knew, a lot of people back in the day that were really great players and signed for nothing or 500 bucks and didn't get a fair shot. Mm-hmm. Then when they came home, people say, well, I, I'm not going to take a chance on him. He, he's already been li- released. Mm-hmm. Detroit got rid of him. He, he mustn't, uh, mustn't be any good. There's got to be something wrong with him. The truth was they, they signed somebody else for $2 million and he took the kid's spot. Mm. You know what I mean? I still think I had the best shortstop ever. He never, never even got a fair shot. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that doesn't happen now with perfect game, right? Like we were considered snowbirds until we went down there and beat everybody up. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we've had, we've had our fair success. I shouldn't say we've had our fair success. The fact that we're from New Jersey is no longer relevant, but the, the scouts that are seeing them at perfect game are the big boys. So a lot of my kids have signed, I had uh, 21 guys last year and 26 the year before. And some of them were first and second rounders. That didn't happen when I grew up. Uh, none of those guys would have been first rounders when I played. So if and, if I hear if I hear that correctly, I think it, the organization of um, the events and the scouting and the evaluations, and uh, with Perfect Game leading uh, the charge in that for for a long time now, and there's other companies that do a good job. That's brought some parity. Now that kid from New Jersey has a pretty good even shot against a kid from Florida or California just because the information is so much better. Am I, I don't want to put it, words it, in your mouth, but is that kind no, of... No, you're, 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 you're exactly right. Okay. The thing that's also happened is they realize it's better to have arms from us than down there because they, they throw too much and they get burned out. I see but that perfect a lot. Game, yeah, perfect game is an even playing field for everybody. And they don't really care where you're from. The scouts watch the games. and you, So they... Jerry Ford... He's a good friend of mine. He's done more for baseball, him and Gary Baldwin, than almost anybody in the in the country. The thing is that there's so many dozens and dozens of copycats. And the other problem that has arisen now, a lot of the college coaches last year, I, I called, you know, I called about 600 of them a year. I must have had to call, call them 20, 30 times to get a return call. That's They don't even return their calls anymore because they're, they, they figure every player in the world is going to be, at, at these big tournaments so yeah. they just go to the big tournaments but they're missing half the kids who play other sports and have pro tools yeah so that's a, that's the a downside of the tournament well there's kids in new jersey that can't afford to play travel ball and uh well you, and beat, you beat me to the punch you, you beat me to the punch i was going to ask you what what are some of the the things about travel ball that are either not so great or things that you might want to improve upon and so that's oh, that's boy. one where the okay yeah. so the the, the coaches, you know, they can go to one event and they can see a ton of guys, which is a great thing, but it can also yep. be a detriment to some yep. kids who maybe aren't in that in that um, in that system. They're, they're not playing because they're going to play football for their um, for their high school or whatever. All right. So what well, what are yeah. what are some of the other opportunities or you know things that you don't like about today the 2019 version of travel baseball? Well, I, you can't like the early signing thing because it, uh, yeah. it, it it just favors the big schools way too much. They run around handing out hats and, and verbal commitments to freshmen on the thought that if they make it and they get really good, we'll have them, and then end up dumping them on signing day. They don't they don't do it. In the meantime, the kids really were Division two and three players that were should not have been signed, but they just did it to cover their butt, and that's that's bad. The fact that a lot of kids can't afford to go. That's bad. I started a foundation to try to raise money to help kids play travel ball, can't afford it. Um, eh, it's, it's gone slow, but whatever. Uh, the other thing is, is they don't practice. Yeah. When you go to uh, a tournament, they don't even take infield. They have cages if you want to practice on your own, but the kids grow up playing Nintendo all week, get a lesson from one hitting guru that was a former Met, according to him, but you never got above the rookie league mm-hmm. and know all they need to know. And so they just go play game, game, games. It's like if, if you go to high school for four years and all you ever did at Eastern high school was take five exams and your five subjects every day for four years, what would you learn? Yeah. Nothing. Right. I understand and that that's completely. The same, that's the same in baseball. Yeah. In other words, your exams are your tournaments, your games. Yep. Right. 
but you're supposed to be doing five to six times more of that in the off season and playing because yeah. great players in the, are made in the off season and the yeah. off hours. In order to play a game, you should practice five times yeah. or work out that much time. And they're not doing it. So as a result, I see the hitters haven't suffered as much. Uh, the fielding is like terrible. I mean, the guys look like they yeah. all have uh, Michael. We call it Michael Jackson disease. You know what that is? <laughs> no, tell me. Wearing gloves for no apparent reason. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Well, let me let me talk on a, a couple of those bullet points. Um, baseball, uh, travel baseball has obviously become quite the uh, the white collar sport. That's 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 no um, no secret. You know, I look at um, you know the the softball world, and yep. I, I, in a lot of ways, I think they're twenty years ahead of the travel baseball world. Because they didn't, oh, they, are. they didn't have the they didn't have the American Legion or Babe Ruth, um, right, right. So so they, there wasn't that other option. While we were in the in the '90s, we were playing Babe Ruth and then American Legion. The the high end softball girls they were already doing travel softball, and so they've figured things out. Now if a if yeah, a, if did. a coach who's listening is looking for a tip, well I'll tell you I, I've worked with a softball team whose top roster ran a budget of about $125,000 on the year, okay? That's yeah, a lot of yeah. money for – you're talking about 12 to 15 kids. That's that's not a lot of kids. Yeah. I'm talking about not the organization's budget. I'm talking about one team. These yeah. girls fly everywhere they go. Meanwhile, yeah. me, you won't believe this, mom and dad pay out of pocket for the entire year just $300, okay? Yeah. How, how do they do that? Because they fundraise like mad. And that's something yeah. that just hasn't come over into the travel baseball world. Now, I'm sure you hear it. You put out a price. It doesn't matter what the price is. Mom and dad are going to complain a little bit. <laughs> and then you say, yeah. then you say at, least, at least what I've been told from other travel ball coaches, they say, okay, well, here's a fundraising opportunity. They just don't want to do it. So they just, they're going to write the check. So until until the families will accept the idea of fundraising and a little bit of sweat equity, it's going to continue to be a white collar thing. Uh, unfortunately, I, the fundraising thing is top of mind for me. It's it's definitely yeah. something I'm looking into. You know, I, I'm. Well, okay, I'll give you a good one. Once, well, everything I do can be hosted by a travel team or organization. All right, and I'll split the money with them. Uh, and I also have vendors that, that will give them stuff cheap. I don't want nothing from that. You just get these prices. But they have to work with us or try to help inner city kids or try to yeah. help us with our, our fundraising for it. But like when I do an All-American College Coach Camp, if a guy says, hey, I can get 50 kids from my organization, we'll bring it, we'll split it with them. Same mm -hmm. with uh, Hit Doctor Hitting and and um, flamethrowers pitching. Uh, we'll do a camp. We'll come and show all your coaches all the stuff. We'll do the kids. I'll uh, bring all this stuff that the major leaders have yeah. at their access. So I get, we got video and software and that kind of stuff that measures everything and launch angles and all that kind of jazz. But when they leave, the coaches will, will be well-armed to teach the game, and half the money goes to the organization. And we we'll do a couple of them a year. It might fund a couple of teams. All I ask is that if you're an Arsenal affiliate or something, uh, that we got a poor kid and we we, we want to see that he gets to play for his local Arsenal, we got to have a do something. So yeah. I started a foundation to try to help help. I I never want people to pay a dollar more than they can afford. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And. Uh, we got to get the cost down. I think with some of the growth of PBR and Perfect Game, they're offering different levels now of tournaments where kids can go and see a lot of D2 and D3 coaches because you never see them down south. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks you're a D1 player, mm -hmm. right? So there's got to be something for the, yeah. for the other divisions. Where do you go for that? Well, yeah. you can go to Diamond Nation in Trenton, and there's 100 – uh, D two D three coaches, but they're looking for the guys that don't have 
a hat from North Carolina mm-hmm. that, that's they're already committed. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of kids that commit never go there. Yeah, but at least we got to have a place for the D two coaches to see kids. Well, the, 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 to to circle back to the fundraising thing, there are a zillion ways to offset the cost. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and part of it ha- happens to be, you know, with with a team um, making a a reasonable schedule, right? You don't you don't have to every single weekend spend three nights in a hotel to go play baseball. There's other ways of doing it. But here's one thing I think about, you know, I've seen teams where kids played for free and in 2019, listen, the, this idea of entitlement is real. And, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, uh, that the, the transformations in the transaction. And, and what that means is people value what they pay for. And if you give, 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 my fear is at least one, one of the holes, one of the negatives you know, of, of doing all the fundraising and, um, and making things free for kids is that they won't value it. Mom and oh, I've, mom seen, and, I've seen that already. Yeah. yeah it, it's, I, I don't associate with, or be want to be connected to recruiting teams, people that steal other people's players by saying, we'll fly you here. We'll fly your mom. We'll fly your dad. We'll cover everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They don't work at it. They just yeah. pick up players. So I'm very anti that. I, yeah. I, I'm is, only given license, licenses to player development type yeah. of teams with the, um, you know, to go back to that softball team I was using as an example, the reason those kids and those families didn't feel a sense of entitlement is because one of the main things that they did for fundraising and it's very common in the softball world, is they're running bingo, okay? They're running bingo yeah. halls 50, 50 weeks a year. And so yeah. mom and dad and kid are putting in sweat equity. And so there, there is this buy-in from – I like, love that. I, I love that. Right? That's so, great. So it, they're, not, they're not getting it for free. Their out-of-pocket expense is very low, but there's still a sweat equity. There's still buy-in in the, in the form of putting in some work. Now I, I don't want to, yeah, they're working hard, working hard to get it. They value it more. Yeah. And there's also a sense of loyalty and a sense of team, Community, which there's none yeah. of that with recruiting teams. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to, I wanted to talk about something like else that. you mentioned, um, was practice. Now I'll tell you, <laughs> you haven't, I, you know, maybe, maybe you have, maybe you haven't listened. The very first episode of, of this podcast I put out, was with Bob Reichman. He's the new owner of the Orlando Scorpions. And he actually made an announcement live on the show, and the information has since been published. Um, the Scorpions have decided to take the month of June off from tournaments. The entire organization at the high school level will play no tournaments. And I just thought of, you know what? Everybody talks about development. And it, t- it took a lot of courage for Reichman and, and the, the staff from the Scorpions to basically put their money where their mouth is and say, well, we talk about development, we're actually going to do development and practice. And I agree with you. I think the practice thing, you know, you were talking about the, you know, the Michael Jackson gloves and, and yeah. you know, and every, you should practice way more than you play. I mean, look at a, yeah, look at a, look, just, yeah. a college team is going to, you know, their their regular season is 50, 56 games, but they're going to practice probably between the fall and the spring probably 150 times. So, you know, how does it make sense that a, a 15 or 16-year-old kid is playing 10 times more than he's practicing? That It's backwards, um, you know. So I, yeah. I, I, I think I think you've nailed a couple things. Now, let me – let me ask you, um, and then we'll we'll start to wrap up here in a few minutes. Back in the '80s, you took a chance, and you you know you thought baseball was going to be something worth leaving a, a a good job as a CPA and and you pursued baseball full time. You know it's 2019 now. What do you where what do you see in maybe one year, five years, ten years from now? Are, are you able to to predict the future for us again? I I hope so. I I think 
I think perfect game is going to uh, take over the tournament world, but I think PBR and people like them are going to explode also for the D2, D3 players. And I think finally what's going to happen already happened in softball 20 years ago. You're going to have a level, B level, C level teams and tournaments who will all practice to play, to maintain their spots on these teams. I think there'll be less recruiting. I mean, you there probably still be with some recruiting team. Some rich guy wants to recruit a few kids, but um, I think it'll come down to like it does in girls travel ball. In other words, they, they play at a competitive level. There's local tournaments they can go to. If you want to go to California and play in the, in, in the big stuff, you raise the money to do it. Uh, I think we're headed towards that. The problem is we're not educating the coaches. MLB has to take responsibility for their own actions. And if they're saying there's not enough black players, not enough American players, which I hear every day, right? Whose fault is that? Right? Mm-hmm. They're the ones that have made it. Uh, they've disconnected. When I when I started all this stuff, none of the pro guys even wanted to be bothered. Why, why are you having showcases for kids to get college scholarships? If they're good enough, let them go play pro ball. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe they're not quite good enough. Right, or maybe you you guys can't cover. You know, they got some of these teams got one scout covering thirteen states now. He 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 sees one or two players a week with the rain here in, in North America. They're missing so many kids mm. that my kids, the, the forty seven guys that signed in the last two years, they signed because they did so good at perfect game, not not because they're. Then when they came up here for their senior year, there was more people there because they did so good at perfect game that I guess the local guys told, Hey, get your butt out there and, and see uh, this Arsenal pitcher. Right. But I, I doubt that if, if Jason groom had ever not going to, uh, you know, he, I mean, we've had a number of first rounders, but Jason groom was rated the number one player in the country. If he hadn't gone to perfect game, uh, you, you'd never heard it. You'd never heard him. He would have got drafted. Right. But it wouldn't have been in the first round. That's interesting. You know? And that, not, yeah, it's it, it's 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 a it's a great system for player development, but right now it's not u- being used for player development. When I coached Legion, we practiced or played every day, and every time we had a game, we played a lot of games. We had practice before the game, be, be an infield, and we did something after the game. Yeah, right. On our off days, we practiced and then practiced. Right. <laughs> Travel ball lends itself to that because I can my team can play five, six, seven games in a weekend. I can film the whole thing. And on Monday we start fixing what was broken. Mm-hmm. We can learn from it. Our pitchers get five more days of rest mm-hmm. and bullpens and mound work and then go away the next weekend to another tournament and see if they do. I like that. That comes back to, like I said, with the school, have an exam every day. No, but we were having exams every weekend, but that, that meant practice. You gotta add. You gotta add the practice. The current schedule allows for it. Like you're saying, there if they're playing every yeah, weekend, that, that allows yes. the time. It's just a matter of getting out and doing it. Getting out and doing it. One yeah. of the things that one of the things that um, I mean, you know, the 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 fielding is definitely a big part of it. But but what really sticks out when you don't practice is the baseball IQ. Baseball, I, I think, I could be wrong, maybe somebody will fight me on this, but I feel like baseball IQ is way down. Um, you know, it, it, it is way down. and uh, it, There's two ways of, uh, of saying baseball IQ. You can say um, situational awareness and, and body awareness. Mm-hmm. And what's, what's really bad is body awareness. The situational awareness like knowing where to go and where to throw it, 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 it can be caught up. Although I, I don't see much of that either, <laughs> but if you're playing all the time, you can collect them during the games to some degree. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. but there's, there's, there's no body awareness and situation awareness isn't, isn't that great. And when I played, you always had that one or two guys like Mike Trout who had such instincts that he got better jumps than everybody. He he was a world class sprinter when he first signed. Uh, he 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 could absolutely fly, 
but he wasn't a sprinter being taught to play baseball. He was an instinctive baseball player who also happened to have world-class speed. And, and, uh, He's 250 pounds now, so he doesn't run as fast as he used to, but he steals bases like crazy because he has instincts. I think a great part of situation awareness is teachable. The next level, that last 10%, may be instinctive. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's improved a great deal by by playing and practicing, but I think the 90% of situational awareness and like I knew I couldn't run fast, so I, I'm i not trying to stretch this into a double. I'm not going to try to go first or third to the shot to left field. That's not necessarily instincts, I don't think. It was something that I was taught or learned because of uh, my speed. Well, maybe that is instinctive because I, I knew not to do that. <laughs> you know, Nobody had to tell me. But you know what I'm saying? Situation awareness is, is almost nil. Uh, with some of these guys, but you know why? Part of it is because a travel coach never played the game. No, yeah. <laughs> Tra- travel ball has made it possible for the manager of Staples, the local drugstore guy, uh, the, the the attorney that has the corner uh, law firm. Now he can go compete. When he coached Legion, he got his head, a butt kicked. Right, right, right. I get it because he because he was he was given he was given a, a group of kids he didn't have a choice over in the American Legion. Right. And he can build a team and not not have ever had to have played the game. Hey, let's start. Let's well, we, start towards uh, towards working uh, working our way towards ending this thing here because I want to be respectful yeah. of your time. I wanted to um, yeah. wanted to ask you a couple last questions. Um, first thing, where can we track you down? If a coach hears something and they want to reach out to you, they're curious about your um, your All American Coaches Camps. Um, where do we track you down? Uh aabaseballcamps.com or uh, hitdrusa.com Are you a Twitter guy? Do you, do you hop on Twitter at all? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Uh, you remember what I your handle is? I don't even know is? what my handle is. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, no. I'll tell you what. But, I will, I'm will. i going to – I'll track it down and I'm going to put it in the show notes. Um, I'll find it out. Yeah, I'll, find I'll, out. I'll track it down. I'll put it in there. Um, so if anybody wants to hit you up on Twitter, I know tw- Twitter seems to be the the spot where coaches congregate on the internet these days. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm just getting into that. I'm like a, a technosaur. So yeah, that's I'm, all right. I'm just that's all right. I want to ask you trying to figure stuff out. Want to ask you one last question? If there's a young, if there's a young coach or a new coach getting into into this world. What's what's one piece of advice you'd like to pass on to that young guy, that young coach? Well, go online, uh, look at some of the stuffs online, and and see if it fits your personality. I mean, you got Matt Antonelli, uh, touch them all baseball, tremendous stuff. Chris O'Leary, out of St. Louis, great, simple information on on the internet that. That's correct. The problem with the internet is there's so much misinformation. You know what I mean? But there's two sources right there. Uh, Antonelli covers every every skill, and so does Chris, and they do a, a super job. But if you get a base of knowledge from those two guys, then you can look at other websites more knowledgeable. Uh, and everything, is, nothing is for everybody. Right. So the more ways you have of saying it, more drills you have to fix it, the better. But they, the people have to get an MLB approach. He, he's an uppercutter or he's a good hitter, but he makes a lot of outs in the air. Is there a way we can change that? He strikes out too much. Is there anything we can do? You got to, you got to find out first what your base is and then what's important and what's not. And that takes a while, right? Yeah. So great job, Coach B. I really appreciate, appreciate you. it. I appreciate your time today. It was an honor to talk to you. It was really, it was really fun, kind of getting to know you um, a couple of days ago when we spoke, and and getting to hear some more of your stories today. Um, this will this will go up, you know, pretty soon. I'll let you know when it goes up, so you can uh, so you can share it with all your friends. Yeah. I do want to la- one last question. At the very yeah. beginning, we mentioned uh, we mentioned your your dad and your mom were baseball people, and they got you into it. Yeah. But but now your your son is also a baseball guy. Can you can you tell us who he is and who's he, who he's yeah, working well, for? It, it, 
it, yeah, it was. He was a great baseball player. He went to Temple University, and uh, his freshman year, he was he had a tremendous year, and he got in a car accident where he's actually parked, and somebody hit him broadside, totaled the car, and he cracked his neck, broke his neck, and he's back in seven places, seven herniated discs. So that ended his baseball career at 18 years old. Mm. He came in with me, and I, I was at the time I was giving away everything. And really didn't have anything. I was spending a dollar more than I made, no matter how much I made. And uh, he came in and said, "Dad, these guys that you you scholarship to 150 kids, yeah, why?" I said, "Because they said they didn't have the money, so I'm not charging them." He said, "Dad, they come here every day in a Beamer and a 400, 300 thousand dollar car, and you scholarship them. No more scholarships." Tell them to call me and I'll, I'll make them work. And that's what he did. He basically helped them to raise their own money. But some some of them, when he told them how much that they had to raise, they, they said, uh, well, how are you going to do it? You know, we'll go sell cookies, cakes, chances, this and that. And they pulled their checkbook out and wrote them a check for cash. So huh. from that point on, I let him I let him take it over. Yeah, people were taking advantage of me. You just yeah. tell Mr. B, uh, you can't afford it. He let you. So, I let you train for nothing. Your, I work my butt off. What, what's your like What's your son's name? Bob. And who's uh, And he, who's he, he currently he's a, working with? He's a v, v, I think he's a vice president for Perfect Game in charge of uh, East Coast or something. Awesome. Uh, but he 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 he's yeah. I'm real good friends with J- Jerry Ford who started it, and mm-hmm. his son befriended my son. So now now they're they're doing a lot of the stuff for P- Perfect Game. But, uh, family yeah, my, business. My Bobby's got a head for business. Yeah, family he's a, baseball. He's a real good baseball guy. It's it's amazing yeah. how many how many coaches I've had on these calls where you can literally call baseball the family business. It's it's been fun to see that whether it's uh you know Tim Nyman, oh, yeah. Tim Nyman and his boys and uh, David Amaro and and his boy and his dad and his brother. Yep. Um, you yep. know you go go down the list and it's and it's and it's literally it's it's baseball's like uh, like in people's blood. It's cool. So, yeah, you grow up, grow up in it. Um, Coach B, thank you so much. And, My pleasure. Uh, you and I will talk again soon. Yeah, anytime. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Rich. Have thank a good you. day. I'm having so much fun bringing these shows to you each week. If you'd like to recommend a coach for the show, please don't hesitate to shoot me a note at rich at playinschool.com or DM me on Twitter at play in school again my name is rich prado i'm the founder of play in school my goal is to continue to create products and services that add value to you the travel ball coaches your players and their parents visit playinschool.com to see some of the ways we're doing that or better yet let's set up a call until next time thank you for listening to travel ball talk